right. So, uh, you might have to help me. I'm pretty sure I'm right, but I'm doing this same series in Houghton Lake, and Houghton Lake is like three meetings ahead of you. Um, and so I get confused sometimes where I'm at here and where I'm at there. But I believe last week we finished the introduction and the first church of Ephesus. Is that right? Okay. So now we're moving on to Smyrna. So uh, that's where we'll start tonight. All right. Very good. Was there any comments about last week or anything? I know there was no questions last week, but did something pop up in your studies that you wanted to ask really quick before we move on? No? All right. Um, let's get into it then. All right, so here's Smyrna's ancient ruins. Also, I want to, um, I guess we're not live tonight, but you'll see this on the recording. We want to thank you for watching us uh, via YouTube or Facebook or whatever platform you're viewing this on. Uh, thanks for joining us as we go through this last day message in today's times. Uh, and we hope that this will be a blessing to you as well at home. All right, Smyrna's ancient ruins. So here on the left, you'll see my, my laser is, is weak. And uh, you can't pick it up. But the left picture, this is the gateway that entered into Samirita Stadium. They were known for having a large stadium. They were proud of it. They had the largest stadium uh, in this area. And we're going to talk about that a little bit later. But here's the ancient ruins for it over here on the right um, of the old stadium where they, they had their games and stuff like this. On the left is the gate going into it. Uh, so the second message was addressed to the church in Smyrna, which is located in modern-day Izmir, Turkey. So all of these churches that we're going through are pretty much in Turkey, in that area on the Mediterranean Sea. Smyrna was located about 40 miles north of Ephesus along the postal route. Remember that the seven churches are on the Roman postal route, um, and you would start in Ephesus, and then you would work yourself around the cycle of the seven churches. Um, Smyrna is located about 40 miles north of Ephesus, and the message from Jesus Christ to Smyrna is the shortest one of the seven churches. So this one gets the shortest message. But let's look at that message tonight. We'll start in Revelation 2, verse 8. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last, who was dead and came to life. I know your works, tribulation and poverty, but you are rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. Do not fear any of these things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison, that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation ten days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. He who overcomes shall not be hurt by the second death. All right, so that's the message to the Smyrna church. It's the smallest one. Smyrna, the meaning of Smyrna is sweet smelling. It's located on the Aegean Sea, about 40 miles north of Ephesus, and it was an important center of trade with a good harbor. The city was also a political, religious, and cultural center. So this is one of your, we would call it a modern city today if it was, if it was here, something like... Um, Boy, I, I don't know what city to pick on it and call, but like Austin is a modern city. It's a cultural center. Uh, Portland, Oregon is known for being a, a cultural center, things like that. So this city probably is very similar to those ones, but it's um, political, religious, and cultural center. It was proud of its famous stadium, library, and the largest public theater in the province, which seated up to 20,000 people. So this was, quite a, this was quite the epicenter for entertainment in this area of it. Because of its wealth and exceptional beauty, the city's claim to be the glory of Asia. So a little bit of pride going on there. It was also noted for the science and medicine industries that flourished there. The city, prob the city probably claimed to be the birthplace of the famous epic poem of Homer. So if you've ever heard Homer, he's from Smyrna, according to them. So we've talked quite a bit about this as we've gotten started. So remember, John is on the island. And what is John on the island of Patmos for? Teaching the gospel, right? He's being persecuted for his faith, right? And what is it about the Romans that they don't like the gospel, particularly being preached? Yes, and I'm going to extend that to emperors, right? Not just Caesar, uh, but to all the emperors. So it became emperor worship, and um, it was everywhere, but Smyrna was really the epicenter of it, right? So this is really going to come into play in Smyrna. So remember, the Romans, um, we've talked about it, we're going to talk about it here in a second, but I'll, I'll remind you, the Romans didn't care that you worshipped other religions. There was a lot of pagans and pag paganism in Roman, Ro Roman, uh, uh, Roman times in ancient Rome, and they didn't really care about that as long as you wor worshipped the emperor too. 
And, and do you guys remember what their fear was? Remember, Rome, even though it's one of the strongest civilizations and strongest societies ever, they're a, they're, they're a fearful society, right? They governed by fear. And how they did that is they got so big and they didn't have enough soldiers uh, to, to put their soldiers everywhere in their whole province, the whole, the whole um, area of Rome and their empire. And so what they would do is they would station what they could in certain areas. And oftentimes, when they would say they had a legion of soldiers there, a legion of soldiers, it was actually closer to 600 troops. So 400 might, you know, less than 1,000 that they claimed to be there. And oftentimes, they were overwhelmed. Like in Smyrna, you have a city that's capable of, of seating 20,000 people just at the theater. So it's quite a large city, and it's being, you know, um, it's being guarded and protected and secured, um, and, and they're with whole, upholding the peace with about 600 soldiers. So you can see that this is not an easy task for Rome. And so what they've done then is they get ahead of things. And the way they get ahead of things is if there's a problem, they squash it with force instantly so that you'll stay afraid of them, and therefore you won't want to revolt. You understand what I mean? And part of that way of doing that was if, you, if, the, if the emperor was a god or a deity in your mind, then you wouldn't, you wouldn't act out of line because you'd be betraying God, which is a powerful motivator, um, obviously. And so this was a, a, a part of that the Christians were running up against. Um, and in Smyrna especially, there was some emperor worship going on. And, and this was part of it. So the Roman Senate granted the city privilege to build a temple in honor of Tiberius. This made Smyrna a center of emperor worship. Late in the first century and after, emperor worship became compulsory for all citizens. As an act of loyalty, it was a civic duty of all citizens to go to the temple once a year and burn incense to the statue of the emperor and proclaim, Caesar is Lord. Those who did this would receive a certificate allowing them to hold a job or conduct business. Those who refused to comply would face persecution and death. So that's the situation that's going on in Smyrna. And prophetically, Smyrna represents the church under pagan persecution. And this period went on from AD 100. So this would be the time after the apostles are dead. At this point, most of the apostles are gone. I don't think John's alive anymore. I think he's dead about this time. Um, so right after the apostles are gone until 313, so about 213 years of church persecution as we look back in time. Um, and because the church would not worship the emperor or pagan rituals, they faced losing their legal status, persecution, and death. Um, so in other words, if you came to Smyrna or any other city that was involved in this emperor worship that was taking place, they didn't care what religion you were, and you could have a business, you could do all these things, if once a year you would go buy your grain and you would burn it as an offering before the emperor and proclaim him to be Lord. And if you didn't, they would take your card from you. You couldn't hold a business, you couldn't hold a home, you couldn't do these things because you were, in, you were then deemed um, outside of their, their religion. And so that's where persecution came from, and then it got worse. Instead of just taking you know, home rights and business rights away from them, then they eventually started to persecute them to the point of death. All right, so Smyrna... Um, represents this time period. And throughout this time, the church experienced tremendous growth while enduring severe persecution. So it's interesting. Nobody likes, um, to, to make an individual application here, nobody likes persecution, right? I mean, let's just be honest about it. As soon as any kind of persecution comes our way, the first thing we do is go to God and ask him to take it from us, right? And there's nothing wrong with that. Don't, don't misunderstand what I'm saying. There's nothing wrong. Sometimes, though, God chooses that it's best not to take that persecution from us right away. He lets us go through a trial, if he will. He doesn't cause the trial, but he allows it to happen because he knows what he can do with that opportunity. See, with God, persecution and trials are an opportunity for him to do something. And, and I know that people have heard this, and I just want to stand very firm about what I'm going to say, and I want you to hear this very carefully. Because I've heard people tell me this, and when they tell me this, my heart shrinks, and I fear what their picture of God is. When they say, when they tell me, yeah, someone told me that this, this lupus that I have, or this rheumatoid that I go through, or this cross I have to bear is because God's trying to save me. I hate hearing that. All right, that is bad theology. That's the theology of Job's friends. All right, we don't want to go there. God will take advantage of the opportunity, and yes, he may use that to get your attention and turn you to salvation, but that is not why that is happening to you. Never forget, we have an enemy in this world. He's the devil, right? 1 Peter 5, 7 tells us we have an enemy. Um, the devil walks around this earth as a roaring lion, seeking whomever he may devour, right? So he's the one who's causing all this sickness. He's the one who causes all this pain. He's the one who causes all these diseases, right? 
God, God may allow it because of the rules of engagement. He has no choice. He has to allow it. But he says that I will use this in Romans 8, 28, right? He says that all things, work to go, all things work to the good for those who love me, right? According to my purpose. So God will take these events and he'll use them to glorify him and to bring his purpose if, if we allow him to, right? But never for a second think in your mind that he caused it to happen. He simply did not. That is not biblical concept. That is satanic. All right, so I'm getting off my platform for a second, but I'll say this. When we go through severe persecution, though, and we come through it praising God. Now, we don't praise God for the persecution, but we praise him through the persecution. Do you understand the difference? All right, make sure you catch that subtlety there. We praise God through the persecution. We praise God through the trial, not for it, but through it, because we know that somehow he's going to work it to good. When we do that, that is a powerful witness to anybody who sees it. Whether it's a coworker, whether it's a family member, whether it's a stranger, if they see this going on in your life and they see you praising God despite of the worst of the worst, that is an influence, a testimony that influences them towards God. You understand what I'm saying? And during this time, even though Smyrna is being persecuted at a terrible rate, and we're going to look into this in a little bit more detail, even though this is happening to them and Christians are being fed to lions and all this stuff, the church is growing. Other people are seeing this faithful testimony of these pure Christians who sit there and say, you can, you can feed us to lions, right? You can whip us to death. You can stab us. You can even French fry boil us. But we are not losing hold of our Jesus Christ. We are not letting go of our Savior. And as a result, thousands and thousands and thousands daily became Christians because of their testimony. So again, we all hate persecution, and there's nothing wrong with hating it. Don't get me wrong. And when it comes upon us, we should pray for it. You should come here and ask us to pray together. We'll all pray for you. We'll surround you, and hopefully it goes away. But never forget that the, icy, the, 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 the silver lining is that God will use it for his purpose to bring him glory, and that's exactly what he did to the Smyrna church. So Revelation 2, 8, this is probably why Jesus introduces himself to Smyrna in the following way. And to the angel of the church in Smyrna write, these things says the first and the last who was dead and came to life. The characteristics of Jesus apply to the situation of the church. Jesus suffered great persecution, but overcame. Jesus is reassuring the church that they may face persecution, but they will be victorious like he was. And you may face persecution in your life, but Jesus tells you that if you hold fast to him, you will overcome as well. Uh, Jesus Jesus comes to them as the one who understands the situation. In other words, you know what the best thing about being a Christian is? By the time we get done with this series, I hope that every single one of you have this memorized. Do you know what the best thing about being a Christian is? Anybody want to guess? All right, Candy, come on. I already know you know the answer because you know every answer I have question I ask. So go ahead. What is the best thing about being a Christian? It is, but do you know why? I guess that's a very ambiguous question. <laughs> Go ahead. <laughs> right, okay. All right, I, I'm not going to be able to get you there with that question. I'm sorry. All right, the very best thing about knowing Jesus is this. You can search and study every other religion out there, and there's only one of them that offers a Savior. There is only one religion out there that says that God created us, and we left his goodness, and he came down to reclaim us. It's only Christianity. Christianity is the only one who has Jesus Christ who said, I will come and live in your situation. I will come and feel a no and, and experience what it's like to go through what you go through, and I will save you as a result of it. That's the best thing about Christianity. And when Jesus comes to the church of Smyrna, he says, I am the one who was dead and came to life. I know what it's like to be persecuted. I know what it's like to, be, to, to feel hunger. I know what it's like to suffer. I know what it's like to be beat. I know what it's like to be abandoned. I know what it's like to be rejected by those who claim to be yours. I know everything that you go through. I've experienced it. And even though it killed me, I came right back to life. And no matter what you're going through, I'll bring you back to life. And I want to just take another second to extend that further. If you're spiritually dead and need revival, Jesus says, I can bring you back to life. All right. So, Ephesus was from AD 30, 31 to 100. I, I believe that's a misprint. That's supposed to say um, Smyrna from 100 to, to 313. But anyways, here's the commendation. They are known for good works, tribulation, and poverty. So Jesus writing to them, he says, listen, you do good works, you, you suffer tribulation, and, and you're, you're, you're poverty-striction for my sake. He says in Revelation 2, 9, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty. 
But even though they're in poverty, what does he say? But you are rich. You might seem like you're poor, but you're rich. And I know the blasphemy of those who say they are Jews and are not, but are of the synagogue of Satan. So this reminds me, I forgot to bring my Bible up here. This reminds me of Matthew chapter 5. Turn there with me really quick. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5 when we have the, the, uh, the Sermon on the Mount. Matthew chapter 5 when we have the Beatitudes. And this is a parallel of the Beatitudes in Revelation. John is coming back to it. He says, I know your works, tribulation, and poverty, but you are rich. Matthew chapter 5, and we're going to start in verse 3. Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they that mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are they that are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. In other words, if you look at these blessed, these beatitudes, everything that we go through down here, all the pain, all the suffering, all the persecution, all the trials, he says, you go through that on earth, but in heaven, you're being fulfilled. You have riches. You might be poor here. This world might leave you poor, but in heaven, you are rich. You have resources waiting for you when you get to heaven. And Jesus is telling them, you might go through, you might, you might have tribulation and poverty here, but heaven is stored up for you and all the resources of heaven are on your side. So uh, this reminds me of, of the Beatitudes, how the negativity that we go through here and what the world says we don't have, Jesus says, you already have by faith. It's already waiting for you. So don't keep your eyes focused on this world. And one last soapbox, and I'm sorry, I'm going on a few soapboxes. Uh, one last soapbox I want to go through one more time um, here is this thought right here. Don't lose sight of this thought. Do you know what Jesus' first message was? I mean, what John the Baptist's message was? For? For the kingdom of heaven is at hand, right? Repent and be baptized for the kingdom of what? Heaven is at hand. Do you know what Jesus' first message was? His first message when he started preaching was, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Do you know what the first message of the apostles was when he sent them out? Repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Now I understand that that's a dual fold message because Jesus was indeed right there in front of them. That's the kingdom of heaven at hand. I understand that, but it's also another purpose. This world is not our home. This world is going to burn. Everything in it, all the possessions we accumulate, all everything that's going on here. In fact, our memories are even going to be wiped away from this world forever when we get to heaven because this is not our home. This is not what Jesus wants us to live in, and this is what not what he wants us to remember. He wants us to think of what? Of heaven, the eternal city, a real city. And so don't lose sight on that. Whatever this world takes from you here, whatever pulls you down here, Jesus says, this isn't your home. Don't focus on what you see around you here because blessed are you when you go through those things because heaven is waiting for you and it's going to be that much sweeter for you. Jesus wants our minds focused on heaven, on the eternal, rather than the, the temporary here. I should have got an amen from that. I should have got a, a bunch of amens for that. Amen. Listen, I know that we've all been taught, and there's some, there's some wisdom in there, so you know, keep some balance here. But I know we've all been taught, listen, it's not about heaven, it's about Jesus, and that's true. But Jesus himself wants you to know that there is a heaven. There is a real city of golden streets and pearly gates and beautiful gem-filled diamonds, and Jesus himself is going to be in that city. And he says that is the universe epicenter from, 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 from the end of this earth moving forward to the new earth and on in all of eternity. And don't lose sight that that is our home, not the one that we live in here. So whatever persecutions you go through here, Jesus says, blessed are you because heaven is yours. Amen? And heaven's going to be so much better than what we have here. All right. So let's talk about the synagogue of Satan. So Jesus also mentions malignant slander from the Jews. 
Jews in the Roman Empire were usually exempted from worshiping the emperor and pagan gods. However, toward the end of the first century, the Jews in Smyrna found themselves in a difficult situation with the local officials. Since Romans identified Jews with early Christians, the Jews wanted to disassociate themselves from Christians. So here you can see the Christians were known as having the, the fish symbol and, and or a form of the cross. And then you had the Jews over here. But the Jews were trying to disassociate themselves from the Christians. And the way they did that was they slandered Christians before the local officials by making malicious accusations and inciting the authorities to persecute them. Although they considered themselves to be the synagogue of God, these Jews actually constituted the what? The synagogue of Satan. And what do you think that means? Why is Jesus calling them the synagogue of Satan? Exactly. You remember the passage in John chapter 8? Let's turn there now. John chapter 8. Let's turn to John chapter 8, verses 33 through 44. I'll read this and we'll go fast. I know it's a lengthy passage. John chapter 8, 33 through 44. Jesus tells us what the Jews had turned into right here on earth, and he shows us um, what the synagogue of Satan is. John chapter 8, verses 33 through 44. 33 through 44. So Jesus is talking to them. Um, and Jesus says, actually, let's start it in verse 31. John chapter 8, verse 31. Then said Jesus to the Jews, which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? Make you free. They answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and were never in bondage to any man. How sayest thou that you shall be made free? Then Jesus answered them, truly, truly, I say unto you, whosoever commits sin is the servant of sin. And the servant abideth not in the house forever, but the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. I know that you are Abraham's seed, but you seek to do what? To kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak that which I have seen in my father, or seen with my father, and you do that which you have seen with your father. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus said unto them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do what? You would do the works of Abraham. If you were of Abraham, you'd be doing the works that Abraham did, right? But then he goes on and he says, but now you seek to kill me. A man that had told you the truth, which I have heard of God, this did not Abraham. You do the deeds of your father. Then they said to him, we be not born of fornication. We have one father, even God. So they go right back to their seed, right? They say, no, we are pure Jews. We are the pure seed of Abraham. And Jesus is saying, I don't care who your father is. I don't care what your ancestry line and how you track your lineage. I don't care what DNA one two or ancestry.com or whatever those are. So I don't care what they say. I'm focused on what you're doing. And what you're doing tells me that you have nothing to do with Abraham. Because Abraham would never do that. He'd be ashamed of you. Right? And then he goes on further. He goes on further. Um, in 32, Jesus said to them, if God were your father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God. Neither came by from myself, but he that sent me. Why do you not understand my speech, even because you cannot hear my word? You are of your father the what? Devil. The devil. And lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar, and the father of it. In other words, when Jesus says that the synagogue of Satan is there, he's talking about these Jews who were lying and causing murder and doing the works of who? Their father, Satan. Jesus says, if you are mine, you would do my works. Regardless of what persecutions come in your direction, you would stand for me. You would stand for right. You would still have compassion and love for other people. You wouldn't let them go through something just because you wanted to avoid persecution. That's what the devil does. The devil's into self-preservation. He says they're of the synagogue of Satan. But many Smyrna's were not. They were of Jesus. They did the works of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, I'll share a personal testimony with you right now. I remember being a kid. And it wasn't my mom that was going through this, but it was someone, it was another woman that I knew that I was close to. Um, and I was just a boy. I was like 11 years old when this happened. And she was being beat one day. And she was yelling my name for help. But the man was beating her was much older and much stronger and much bigger. And I did nothing. I did nothing because I was a boy. And I justified that I did nothing because I was a boy. 
that moment haunts me still to this day. And I can tell you that no matter what I would have went through then, no matter how bad the whooping would have been, it would have been better than living with the shame of doing nothing for the last 32 years of my life. You understand what I'm saying? I don't know what the persecution is that you may face, but trying to preserve yourself and letting other, somebody else catch trouble for something so that you can have a goodness of life will haunt you the rest of your life, and in the end, it will simply not be worth it. It's always best just to follow Jesus, just to do the right thing. The same thing they did to Jesus, they are now doing to his followers in Smyrna. Jesus left us a promise in John 16, In the world you shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Revelation 2, 10. Do not fear any of these things which you are about to suffer. Indeed, the devil is about to throw some of you into prison that you may be tested, and you will have tribulation 10 days. Be faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. Jesus says, I know some of you are going to be persecuted greatly. In fact, you're going to be thrown into prison, and for 10 days, it's going to be exceedingly really bad. He says, but hold on to the end, and I will give you the crown of life. During these two centuries, the pagan Roman emperor tried to destroy the Christian church altogether. They tried to stomp out any Christian they came across. The worst persecution was during a span of 10 years. This was known in history as the Great Persecution between 303 and 313 AD. This was under the Roman emperor Diocletian as as indicated in verse 10, as tribulation for 10 days. So remember, in prophecy, a day in year, a, a day equals how much in prophetic time? A year. So this 10-day period was this 10-year time of persecution under Roman Emperor Diocletian, who was just a nasty, terrible person. And we could go through his exploits, but I don't think we need to. I think you guys know enough about the sickness and the degradity, um, the depravity of, of human, humanity, and we don't have to get into that. So this is their promise. The crown of life referred to here is the garland given to the winner at the ancient Olympic Games. The crown that Jesus promised to the faithful in Smyrna is eternal life to be given at his second coming. You guys, you guys know what the Olympics are, right? And you know all the thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of hours that these great athletes all around the world train for for this piece of gold. Well, in Roman times, it was a garland they put on their head. And they, they worked tirelessly for this, and they went through pain, and they went through trials to get to this where it is. And Jesus says, you're going to go through that, but you will be rewarded with this crown of life. I'm going to put that on your head personally. Jesus has nothing on Smyrna. His reproof, nothing. Jesus knew their works of faith under trial. His promise was, be faithful unto death, and I will give you a crown of life. He that overcomes shall not be hurt of the second death. These Christians would rather die than deny their Lord Jesus. The second death is here described. Um, you can read it later in Revelation 20, verses 11 through 15. Jesus describes the resurrections in John 5, 28 and 29, some to life and some to eternal damnation. The people of Smyrna chose life with Jesus in heaven, not life without him in this world. So there's a time coming soon, maybe sooner than we think, where we'll be persecuted. But Jesus promises the same to us a crown of life if we endure. Moving on to Pergamum. Here's the ancient ruins of Pergamum. Um, the third message was addressed to the church located in Pergamum, which is modern-day Bergama, Turkey. Pergamum is about 40 miles northeast of Smyrna. Guys, here's the problem. I can't get into this because I won't be able to finish it tonight, so I think we should stop here and uh, go home a little bit early as opposed to stay late. Is there any questions? All right, well, let's pray. Well, because it's going to take us a while. Dear Father, I just ask that you will bless us, that this message will stay with us, that we will hold faster in our persecutions and trials, that we will look to you and keep our eyes on the city of gold instead of this, this uh, dying world, and that when you come, we will be found faithful in you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, so we'll start here next.